And I'm going to share my screen to our Morocco webinar. And can everyone see that okay? Okay, awesome. Um, so thank you everyone so much. I know it's a Sunday um, and it's so great that we can find the time where we can all, oh my gosh, so many people are entering. 303. Um, okay, so let me just make sure that this person is in and connected before we get going. Okay. Um, yeah, as I was saying, um, we're just really grateful that we can create this space with you guys to share more about who we are at Dragons, but also specifically what a Morocco program could look like. And we have the incredible Kristen here with us who leads our Morocco programs um, and is based in Morocco. So we're very thankful for her for joining us late at night. Um, this was really designed to share insight on who we are and what a program could look like. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to jot them down or put them in the chat and we can get to them at the end of the session. Um, we'll do introductions just so that you guys know who is talking to you, but I am Sammy. I am an outreach coordinator for Dragons. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and my job is really to help students and families find programs that are right for them. So from the second you find us to when you get on the plane, I'm supporting you through your application, finding your program, um, and just planning your summer or gap year in general, in addition to a bunch of other fun outreach stuff on the East Coast. I'm based in New York, um, and I love Dragons and the work that they do and feel so connected to it because I'm a former Dragon student. I did an Indonesia summer program um, a few years ago and just feel super connected to this. And if you leave this and you want to go to Indonesia, you should want to go to Morocco. But if for any reason you want to join us again, we're having a bunch more webinar sessions for every single country and region that we travel to. You can find it on our website. And I'll let Kristen introduce herself too. Awesome. Thanks, Sammy. Hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Generis, and I am the Morocco Program Director for Dragons. Um, I have been with Dragon since I think 2015 now. I've worked mostly in China and Morocco. Um, like I said, I'm currently our Morocco program director, um, which just means that my job is to support our communities on the ground here in Morocco, um, to support our instructor teams, to build up our programming. And um, I'm based in Rabat. So I am sort of the point person for, for any of the, the questions and things Morocco related. Um, I'm really excited to share with you more about our programming. The last year I've spent a lot of time um, sort of picking up the pieces after COVID and uh, rebuilding programming. And there's a lot that I'm really excited about. So looking forward to sharing with you all. Amazing. Um... So just to run through of what we're doing, and by the way, all the pictures that are in this webinar are from Kristen and from Morocco. So they're just amazing. Um, a run through of what we'll do, we'll do a bit of an introduction to Dragons and who we are. Oops, I'm getting more. Um, an introduction to Morocco, what makes these programs different, what a typical structure of a course looks like um, in like specific relation to Morocco the different program components that we'll explore in Morocco, the themes and the highlights of the program, and then we'll go through some question and answers um, so you guys can feel really comfortable with all of the information. So just a bit about our name because it's, A, I love this story, but B, many people have wild questions about how we got it. Um, but map makers in ancient China used to draw maps draw dragons on places on the map that they hadn't gone to, to represent lands unknown to them. So to go where there be dragons means to go somewhere that's unknown to you. Um, so we say that when we go to these places and we're engaging in the unfamiliar, we're also exploring new parts of ourselves and the world. A bit about who we are. Dragons has been in the industry for over 30 years. Um, we started when our founder, his name is Chris Yeager, was on a program in China and he really disliked the structure of it. And he actually rented a car and drove into rural China to create his own sort of semester experience. And he came back to the U.S. and he 
really wanted to share this experience with students. And the first year he drove around out of his car with pamphlets and he somehow recruited 12 students to join him on the first ever Dragons program in China. Um, and since then, we've obviously evolved into a really robust, really um, like networked, frameworked organization. But I just love that story because it really speaks to the ethos of who we are and what we're trying to get at, which is real immersive experiences. Um, we specialize in high school and college student group experiences. So our summer and our fall and spring gap semester programs. We also do a bunch of other global education uh, projects as well with partnership schools, with educators and parents and family travel. So global education is really our expertise. Um, our summer programs run for two, four, and six weeks in the summer. Um, Morocco is a four-week summer program. It starts at the end of June. Every program has the same start date and it ends at the end of July. Um, and these are for ages 15 through 22. Our ages are really a suggestion. So if you're a little bit younger, a little bit older, but Morocco is really where you want to go, I would highly recommend signing up for it anyways. It's more based on maturity than it is actual age. And our three-month gap semesters are for students who take a year between high school and college or a semester in college or a semester abroad. Um, and they can get a full 16 credits worth on a program. And that's for students graduating seniors up until the end of college, so 22, 23. A little bit about what makes us different. Um, I know that there are so many organizations out there. It's so overwhelming. I remember when I was looking for a program. Um, so I just think it's nice to share what really makes us different. Um, the first is that we really engage in unfiltered travel. So this means that we're taking every opportunity we can to get as close to living and learning and loving other people just the way that the locals do throughout Morocco. Um, so this means we're engaging in homestays with families who take in our students because they really Really want to. Um, we're eating local foods. We're taking local transportation. We're not going to be going sightseeing or taking tour buses. We want to experience life in another place. And so that's going to look like doing things just the way that the locals do. Um, and every program that we go on is custom crafted and one of a kind. So even when we've been going Morocco for, you know, decades, we've been running these programs for a while, every summer, every semester is going to be a little bit different. And that's because of our expert instructors. Our instructors are really experts in their field. Um, we always have three instructors. One is always going to be from the country we're traveling to, a local instructor. One is has lived there before, has traveled there before, has some knowledge of Morocco. And the third is either similar to the second or is a general jargons instructor. So you're getting an immense amount of local knowledge and fluency from these instructors that can really craft the programs a bit differently every time. Um, and another way that this kind of works is because our groups are so small. So we have 12 students and three instructors and we keep our groups small for a few reasons. The first is, just like I was saying, if the students have a specific interest that they're all really passionate about, then our instructors will work to incorporate that a bit more into the itinerary. Um, this also allows for really special mentorship between the students and the instructors. This is the highest ratio of student to instructor in the industry. So it really allows for those special one-on-one -on -one connections, personal growth and challenges that the instructors can like consciously seek out for their students. Um, and we're just really conscious about the way that we travel and the space that we take up every country that we go. So keeping it small allows us to lessen our footprint environmentally and also just space-wise that allows us to be a bit less of a distraction in the places we're going and really integrate as much as we can while still being outsiders to these communities. Um, so that's just really special. And then finally, which many of the parents always love and sometimes the students don't, is our unplugged experiences. Um, this means that we are a no phones program on all of our programs, which I mean, the benefits go through the wazoo, but just really being present and connected to the places that we are is super important to us. Um, not having that crutch, right, of times where we're uncomfortable or, you know, you get on an elevator and you have a few minutes, so you're checking your phone. Being present for all those small moments really shapes students' experiences and leads to connections and understandings that they wouldn't otherwise have. Um, of course, we want students to bring cameras and MP3 players and, you know, guitars and all of the fun stuff that normally comes with a phone without that sort of like Wi-Fi social media connection. Um, and if you have questions about how our students can get in contact with parents, we can ask that at the end. Um, last thing on my end is what makes a typical Dragon student. Um, 
There is none. A dragon student is someone who is really curious and really passionate about travel. It doesn't matter, you know, who you are or where you've come from or what experiences you've had. We have students from all around the globe, students who have never left their hometown or state before, or students who have traveled to a bunch of countries. Um, some students, you know, speak the language, some students don't. So really just spans the kind of radar of what a student can look like. But the underlying values are all the same. They're really curious. They really want to engage in a new place. Um, they really want to do it in a meaningful way. And they're looking for something a bit off the beaten path. They feel like there's more out there for them. Um, Dragon students are, they're just awesome. They're, they're really great kids. Um, and I am going to pass it over to Kristen so that you guys can learn more about Morocco specifically. And then again, we're going to save all questions for the end. Thanks, Sammy. All right, everyone. So I'm going to share a little bit about Morocco, um, about our programming in Morocco, some of the highlights, and then, of course, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, as Sammy said. Um, so this is just a general slide about Morocco to sort of introduce you to the country for those of you who are less familiar. Um, Morocco, there are many languages spoken throughout the country. One of the things that I have loved, I've lived in Morocco now for about four and a half years. Um, and one of the things that I love the most is just the diversity of cultures, language, um, of everything really here. Um, the landscapes are super diverse. So in terms of, of languages, you have the main languages. Uh, the main two official languages are Arabic and Amazigh. Um, Amazigh, you may be familiar with this term. Um, or you may be more familiar with the term Berber. Um, they're used interchangeably. However, we use the word Amazigh because the word Berber comes from the word barbarian and has a, a pretty colonial history to it. Um, but there are four dialects of the Amazigh language at least. Um, and then you have languages including French and Spanish and even Italian and other languages spoken throughout the country. Um, so linguistically, there's there's a lot going on that they, people here tend to um mix a lot of languages and so oftentimes you hear a mix of Arabic and French or an Arabic and Spanish or Arabic and Amazigh languages depending on where you are throughout the country. Um, Morocco is 99% Muslim however there is an overwhelming sense of acceptance and um, um, Moroccans tend to pride themselves quite a lot on their religious and cultural acceptance of others. There's a long history of Judaism and Christian influences throughout the country as well. And I'll speak more about that um, in one of the slides. Um, the national drink is mint tea. There's lots of colorful cities, which is just sort of a fun fact. Um, Marrakesh, for example, is required that the buildings are all painted this salmon pink color. Um, Chef Shawan is blue. You may have seen some very Instagrammable photos of Chef Shawin before, um, but many of the cities have color themes and, and that makes it really beautiful and, and fun to explore and to see um, lots of diverse landscapes throughout this the four week summer program, throughout the semester program, throughout our travels in Morocco. Uh, we cover mountains, um, desert, ocean, like seaside, um, in urban spaces, so just about every sort of um, different landscape you can imagine, we move through it on these programs and, and discuss um, how these landscapes interact with people and culture in different ways. Morocco gained independence in 1956, so it wasn't that long ago, and um, I'll talk more about how this fact is woven into some of the themes of our programs. Um, all of our courses at Dragons go through a similar course progression, and that starts with the orientation. Um, our orientation is the time at the beginning of the course that we carve out for our students to build a rapport with each other, with our instructors, um, and as well with the country. And so we go over risk management, we teach the students risk management tools, we assign students leadership roles. Um, the orientation is really a space for grounding and getting comfortable and feeling safe where we're at. It also um, is a space for us to set expectations for the program, for the students to set expectations and goals for themselves. Um, and then we move out of that space into skill acquisition. The skill acquisition phase of our course progression is really students um, starting to learn language, starting to learn navigational skills. Um, 
learning how to gain cultural competence, really. And then we move it into practice. Um, practicing having students go out and buy water on their own or going out to, to make decisions for the group, uh, maybe bargaining in the shop for something or being a liaison for a, a guest speaker. Um, so that practice phase sort of weaves in and out of the, the program itself. Um, and then we also carve out a really special time on our program, which is the expedition phase or also known as X phase. X phase is a really exciting time where we actually hand the reins over to the student group and we teach them how to build a risk management plan, how to build out an itinerary. Um, we have different leadership activities so that they can identify their own leadership styles and their peers' leadership styles. Um, and, and then we let them we let them plan a portion of the program. And so it gives them agency over the trip. It gives, gives them agency um, over what they're learning and an opportunity to work together and, and use those leadership skills and, and that cultural competency skill that we've been working on. The X phase can last, um, it depends on the program um, and, and where the student group is at and their comfort level with it, but it's anywhere between um, usually a few days um, and longer programs, perhaps a week or even two. And then finally, we um, we make it to our transference stage. Transference is probably one of my favorite uh, aspects of our programming. It's the time and space that we carve out at the end of a program in that last week of the program or the final days where we talk about how do we carry this experience with us? How do we uh, take what we've learned and apply it to back home? How do we uh, maintain the friendships and the relationships that we've built here? And then how do we communicate about this experience or what do we do with it? All right, so in addition to this course progression, another thing that sort of guides our programming here and um, what these programs look like and that help inform how they're built is our program components. So these nine program components, rugged travel, homestays, language study, trekking, learning service, social and environmental justice, independent study projects, religious and spiritual traditions, and the focus of inquiry are on every Dragons program. So these components show up in some way, shape, or form on all the programs. And on some programs, you'll, you'll see that um, certain program components stand out or are emphasized greater than others. Um, if you go to the next slide, for Morocco, the, the program components that I think we have a stronger emphasis on is comparative religion or spiritual and religious traditions, um, international studies and an emphasis on social and environmental justice. And then I also just I want to point out the, um, that language learning is also a big program highlight here. Um, so these are some of the things that I think stand out the most on our programs, um, as well as that, you know, this diverse landscapes and cultures, I think also falls into the focus of inquiry, um, which basically means the, the themes that show up throughout our program or how we um, develop curriculum for our programs. All right, so I'll just talk a little bit about language study. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of languages spoken in Morocco. Um, and the fun part is that we get a chance to kind of dip our toes into all of them. The main language that we focus on is Darija. Darija is Moroccan Arabic. It's the dialect of Moroccan Arabic. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's actually quite different than other dialects of Arabic. Morocco and Algeria perhaps have the most different dialects of Arabic. And so, for example, I used to live in Egypt. I actually I did an educator's program in Jordan. I've spent quite a bit of time in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and when I had first come to Morocco after having lived in Egypt and spent time elsewhere, um, many people could understand me here, but I wasn't able to understand them with those dialects. And so, um, if you are interested in studying Arabic and, and here for that reason, that's just something to consider. However, um, there is a lot of overlap. And I think um, if you are someone who who's interested in Arabic, I'd be happy to chat more with you about what that looks like and, and how you can um, go about that. We'd also have the option for you to study standard Arabic, modern standard Arabic, 
um, in place uh, or like as an independent study project. Um, so that's something to consider and to think about. Um, but we will have lessons in Eurasia. So students will get to, to not only take lessons in a, in a more classroom setting like this, but also have more experiential learning opportunities where they are tasked with using their language skills outside of the classroom. Um, and then as well, there will be uh, Amazigh lessons. And so as we move throughout Morocco, like I said, um, once we get into the High Atlas or up in the north in the Reef Mountains, a lot more Amazigh is spoken there. And so they'll also get to learn that so that they can communicate in homestays and places where people are speaking much less um, or perhaps not any Darisha. Um, in terms of French and Spanish, I often get the question of if that's something that we focus on on these programs. Um, if, if you do speak French or Spanish and are interested in practicing that, that's fine um, throughout the country. As I said, depending on where you are, for example, here in Rabat, where I live, there's a very strong mix of French and Arabic spoken. Um, and, and many people do speak French here in Casablanca and Marrakesh. But once you make it to the north, Tetuan, Tangier, many more people are speaking Spanish. And that mix between Arabic and Spanish is, is much more common. Um, it's like as I said, it's it's totally fine if you're interested in practicing those languages. We don't facilitate teaching in French or Spanish, just as um, it, they are the colonial languages, and it, we do think it's important to focus on the the local and indigenous um, languages and cultures first. All right, I'll just share briefly about our homestay. So as the next few slides are kind of touching on these program components, and I'll just speak a little bit to them specifically in Morocco. Um, the, the photo on, on the left here is an image from one of the places where we have our, our host, our rural homestays. It's a village um, in the High Atlas Mountains called Ait Bougamez. Um, it's quite rural. It, the, the region is known for, for growing apples. And so apple picking is something that we get to do at different times of the year. We're getting to understand how people work with the apple fields and, and their land here. Um, so students are placed in homestays in Ait Bougamas. And then as well, we, we also offer urban homestays. And this summer it will either be in Tetuan up in the north, where again, you have that mix of Spanish culture and influence or here in Rabat, um, which is the capital city and a much more urban, um, small urban center. All right, as I mentioned, there is a pretty strong emphasis on religious and spiritual traditions here in Morocco. Um, I'm really excited because we have three partnership programs coming up next month um, throughout the month of Ramadan. And so students coming during that time will really get to experience um, what it's like to live here during the holy month of Ramadan. Um, in these pictures here, you can see the left is a group of students at uh, the mosque in Casablanca. It's the second largest mosque in Africa, one of the largest in the world. Um, and it is actually since French colonization, it is illegal for people who are non-Muslim to go into mosques. And this is the only mosque that people are permitted in. And so it's a really neat opportunity um, in Casablanca that we have to go and explore this part of culture. Uh, on the right, you see a synagogue in Fez. Um, there are Jewish neighborhoods in almost every city in Morocco. Um, the current king has done a lot over the last several years to really promote Jewish history, um, heritage and culture um, and the preservation of different religious sites. And so while there are very few Jewish people still living in Morocco, um, it still is a pilgrimage site for many and, and many people co um, consider this uh, a home or where there's historical roots here. And so we do get to spend time um, sort of moving in between these religious spaces and learning about them from different community members. All right, learning service. Um, if you have, if you are unfamiliar with Dragon's Take on learning service, I recommend that you go to our website and read the position papers on learning service. When a former Dragon's instructor, or I should say, current Dragon's instructor. Um, 
Clara Bennett wrote an amazing book um, with her work in Dragons on learning service and what it means to do service in different parts of the world. Um, we take a very intentional approach to this, uh, considering our place as outsiders coming in for a very short period of time. And so in Morocco, the way we approach service is um, oftentimes we do service work with the American Fondook, which is a, a free veterinary clinic in Fez. Um, you can see the photo of a student um, from last summer taking care of a baby donkey. There's actually recently, as I've been, um, as we've been sort of developing programming, donkeys have been a pretty big theme here as well. They're pretty critical to Moroccan culture and livelihood. One of the places we stay in Moulay Dri Sarhoun, which is the founding place of Islam in Morocco. Um, there's Roman ruins there. It's a it's a where we typically have our orientation site. And so it's a really neat place to stay. One of the women there um, in this small town organized a a, donk, a free donkey clinic as well. This town is totally reliant on donkeys as porters to move throughout the the, the town. And so, um, yeah, we also we get to visit and have a guest speaker from a donkey museum in Tangier. And so lots lots about donkeys. And this is um, sort of our, our a, a glimpse into what the service components look like in Morocco here. Sorry, Kristen, did we lose you? I don't know if it's just me or if anyone else, no one else. Okay, I think we lost her. Um, let's just give her a second. I'm going to just shoot her a quick message. And let her know. Oh, sorry, I think. Did okay, she's back. <laughs> Yeah, we sorry. lost you for a second, but you're good now. Oh no, I'm so sorry. Um, did you hear my whole spiel about learning service? We heard learning service. We lost you just as we switched to independent study. Okay, awesome. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Um, so independent study projects, um, really can be anything. I, which this is another one of my favorite parts of Dragon's programming is that the independent study projects give students an opportunity to explore something that they're interested in. And so, like I said, if a student is interested in diving deeper, for example, into learning Arabic, um, that could be their independent study project. A lot of what we've done in Morocco, and this, this looks different across all of our programs, um, but Morocco tends to have a pretty strong emphasis on artisanal crafts, and that ends up being what a lot of students do for their independent study projects. Um, Morocco is very well known for its artisanal work, and such as the liege, which is the beautiful mosaic tile making. So we get to make those on program. Um, you can see on the photo on the left here, the embroidery, each city has its own style and pattern of embroidery, metalwork, henna, these are all examples of, of what an independent study project could look like, as well as weaving, I've had students make shoes, leather shoes before, um, woodwork as well is popular. And so there's lots of different options, um, but lots of lots of hands on work, which is really fun. And I think students really enjoy that opportunity to to learn a new craft and skill. All right, um, social and environmental justice. This program component shows up in a number of ways throughout our program. One of those ways is being discussing Amazigh identity, as I had mentioned earlier. Um, the popular term for Amazigh people is Berber, and, and this tends to be quite problematic. Um, and, and Amazigh people have faced quite a lot of discrimination up until recent years, where um, you know, it wasn't until just recently that the Amazigh language became an official language in Morocco. The script, the writing script of Tifina, um, was just just formalized, I think, in 2017, so also very recent. Um, 
And then there's also um, a lot of our programming here revolves around learning about nomadism, um, understanding the complexity of borderlands, how they impact indigenous communities and ways of life. Um, we often get to visit nomads as they move from, from place to place, um, visiting them in caves that they call home for, for certain periods of time. Um, we work with guest speakers who are doing work on desertification and trying to preserve desert spaces and nomadic lifestyles. Um, that has become increasingly difficult with borders um, between Algeria, Morocco, Mauritania. Um, and so this is a really interesting, I think, component, very unique component to Morocco is really, you know, there are very few nomads left in the world. Um, and so being able to connect with people who still maintain this lifestyle and who are able to um, share with us about what, what this light is like and what some of the challenges they face are is really special. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, um, Morocco gained independence not so long ago, just in the 1950s. And so we explore a lot of the lasting impact of French and Spanish colonialism and imperialism here. Um, there's discussions on misconceptions about women in Islam and different issues that women face here as well. Um, yeah, and so these are some of the, the main social and environmental justice topics that arise on our program and that we get to dig into and explore. All right, um, the focus of inquiry, like I said, is sort of the themes throughout the program. I've already touched on this a bit, discussing sort of a history of colonization and its impact on culture, religion, and international relations. International relations, I think, is a really important theme of this program. Um, for those of you who are from the United States, Morocco is the first country in the world to have recognized the United States as a country. And so there's an interesting international relation between US Americans and Moroccans. Um, the US has its only national landmark outside of the country in Morocco, and that's located in Tangier, the American legation. And so that's something that we at times visit on programs also. Um, and then again, Tangier um, is a very interesting case study on this because it was designated as an international territory for quite a long time. And so we get to explore what was the impact of that? Um, what does that look like? Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the geography of the region, Tangier is just across the Strait of Gibraltar from Spain. Um, for those of you interested in the semester program, it will be crossing between Morocco and Spain, which is really exciting. We're building a two country program, semester program, um, that will look at the, look at El Andalus, Andalusia as, um, as sort of a whole region and discuss the history of that, um, stemming from when the, the Moors were expelled from Spain, most of them had come to Morocco. And so we see a lot of that Andalusian influence here um, as well as in Spain. So, it, um, so lots of overlap and interesting things to talk about there. Again, um, another big theme is Amazigh identity and culture and looking at how that is different throughout the country um, and different lifestyles there. All right, I just listed a few learning objectives for you all. I have a pretty strong background in teaching. Um, and so my sort of putting on my, you know, taking off my Morocco program director hat and more of my teacher lesson planning hat. Um, I like to include learning objectives for all of our programming here. And so you can, I'll just briefly kind of touch on these. Um, Looking at the geographical significance, again, as I was just speaking about, you know, the proximity to Spain in the north, um, I discussed earlier about the different landscapes throughout Morocco and how those influence culture. Um, and then we talk a lot about sustainable tourism and what does it mean to be a country that hosts so many tourists and, and um, what does that look like in terms of cultural authenticity. Um, Morocco has a very high GDP of tourism and spaces such as Marrakesh or um, the Sahara can be built around tourism at times. And so kind of unpacking what that looks like as we ourselves are travelers in these spaces and, and how to navigate that. 
um, engaging in interfaith discussions and dialogues. We bring in local religious le leaders, storytellers. One of our dragons instructors actually um, has had won um, best storyteller in Morocco in 2017. He's a pretty impressive artist um, who's now trying to pass on this craft of storytelling to others and, and has opened up a storytelling school. Storytelling historically in Morocco is an incredible art form. And that's how, how you know, as I had mentioned, the Amazigh script was just sort of formalized a few years ago. And before that, so many of the histories were passed on orally through storytelling. And, um, and that includes religious stories and, and, and so on. Um, so it's really it's really special that we get to work with storytellers. And, and that's actually another really cool learning component and something that students could do as an independent study project is engage more in the art and craft of storytelling. Um, and then, as I said, experiencing Moroccan art forms, lots of different art forms, um, participating in workshops, that's another learning objective. The photo here I'll just mention um, is of the Roman runes in Volubilis, which is um, the, the ancient city. It's still an archeological site that's being excavated. Um, it, it has an ongoing excavation, but it is very near to where I had mentioned the, the donkey clinic is and where we stay. Um, we actually can do a trek from that town Muli Dri Sarhun into Volubilis on donkeys. And so that's that's really a, a highlight and a fun experience. All right. Um that kind of, that's kind of my wrap up for the program components or just to give you an idea of what these program components look like on our Moroccan programs. I thought it would be fun to share a few images and just share a little bit about food in Morocco so that you can get an idea of of what you might eat for for a month. Um, on the right here, you can see a student who is learning how to to roll couscous and and make couscous from scratch. Um, on the left, you can see this is a popular type of donut called spinge. I often like to tie these on strings as an icebreaker activity from a ceiling and make students try and eat them <laughs> without their hands. Um, but it's a very traditional thing that people eat for breakfast. If you go to the next slide, um, on the left, you see lots of bread type foods. Um, this is some of what a typical breakfast might look like. Bread is a staple here. We get to do bread baking workshops as well. Um, bread is, you eat bread with almost every meal people eat often um if you look at the photo on the right it's a photo of tagine this is the most traditional dish there's different types of tagine it's the name of both the vessel that you cook in as well as the the dish itself um and you eat with your hands using bread to pick apart the pieces and it's shared as you can see in the center photo of couscous being eaten couscous is eaten every friday after people go to the mosque so typically Moroccans will go to the mosque, have their Friday prayer. And then after the Friday prayer, they gather around together and they share couscous, um, which looks like this. And of course, tea or a te, as we say here, um, you will drink a lot of tea in Morocco. Um, as I said, it is the national drink, it's mint tea. Um, if for those of you who haven't tried it before, it's, it's a Chinese gunpowder, green tea. Morocco's actually, um, this is a very interesting fun fact that I learned not too long ago. Um, Morocco is China's largest tea export in the world. Um, and so we have, there's so much tea drink here. It's, um, would be almost impossible for you to arrive somewhere to be a guest in someone's home without being offered tea. Um, it's it's a very much a cultural tradition and staple here. And so you can see I have lots of photos of tea um, in various aspects for our programming. And if you get really good at pouring it, you could pour it like this man who's pouring above his head. <laughs> um, there are some uh, 
um, theories or um, people say that the higher you pour the, the teapot up, the more respect that you give to somebody. All right, and then this is just sort of um, the last note that I'll make about some pre-program preparation. Um, health and safety, I think on all of our programs, one of the biggest things to look out for is GI issues. Um, other than that, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, we, Dragons put, has a pretty robust um, packet of information that you'll receive upon signing up that will, that will clue you into some more of the specifics on health and safety, um, vaccines, and that goes with vaccines and medications. We only require what the country requires. Dragons is not able to give specific medical advice. That's something that you'll have to chat with your doctor about. Um, but typically for Morocco, there's nothing that is, is really required um, or that I'd say is like um, a super necessary thing to have coming here. Um, if you are a U.S. citizen, you have a three month or 90 day visa upon entering. And that's pretty easy to sort out. It's just on arrival. You don't need a special visa for that. Um, and general packing tips there is. I, I think one of the big questions that comes up about this is just um, cultural, being culturally appropriate um, in terms of dressing and, and lots of concerns around that, especially in the summer when it's hot. Um, as I have said a few times, Morocco is a very diverse place. Um, in major cities, you see that people will dress very much um, perhaps the way you do at home. Um, where different people do, you know, it, it's it's a variety. I recently hosted an administrator here for a site visit, and she her one of her biggest takeaways was she just couldn't believe the diversity and how people dressed and looked on the streets. Um, so I, I'd say like we really encourage it is a, a space or a country where we encourage students to to dress more conservatively. Um, with that being said, I think it is very nuanced at times and, and we help facilitate this this question with students and have discussions about it based on the different areas of Morocco where we're traveling. Um, there's a really great post, I think it's on the Dragon's blog about um, the nuances of, of maybe like a dress code or, or dressing conservatively in different places. It's by Jenny Wagner. And so if you look through that, or if you're interested, feel free to send me a message and I'll share that with you. Um, but I think that's all I have in terms of preparation and just sharing a bit more about our program. Again, I'm super excited about some of the the new programmatic elements that we've included recently in the last year or so, um, the communities that we're working with are really exciting. And again, just you know, from north to south in the country, there's just so many different cultures and languages and landscapes that we move through, ancient caspas and um, historical runes and um, really, really hospitable families who welcome students um, in the mountains and in our cities here as well. Um, I'll turn it over to Sammy, and then I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was amazing. I want to go now. Um, I'm just going to touch on a few more logistical things, and then we'll leave like a good 10 minutes for questions. Um, so we've just heard like what a Morocco program looks and feels and tastes and smells like. Um, and a lot of the questions we got is like, why is this kind of travel so important? And, and why would like a dragons program, like what would it lead to? What, why should we engage in this kind of travel? Um, the first point is really students come out of these programs with an immense amount of personal growth. This comes from so many different things. It comes from the small groups and the really close mentorship that we get from the instructors. It comes from the challenges and being comfortable in uncomfortable situations, pushing past what is known and learning more about ourselves. Um, I like to say that when we travel to a place we don't know, and when we're with people we don't know, we're kind of forced to be ourselves because it's the only version of ourselves that we really know, right? When we're with our school friends or our family or whatever, we kind of put on different masks, which is just human. But when we're put in these positions that are unknown to ourselves, we're really 
our authentic selves comes out. And then we can learn like, what does Sammy like and what is she good at and what do I need to work on? Um, and so this whole concept of personal growth is really just inherent to travel, but is really like carefully curated on a dragons program. Um, cultural competency is just obviously so huge and so important to us, understanding that there's many different ways to live on the planet um, and coming from that with a place of like love and acceptance and not judgment is really key to Dragon's framework. Um, learning how to communicate across cultures, how to be a responsible traveler. Um, we often dive into like a lot of, you know, anti-colonial work or understanding like our place as foreigners because we're not just American. We, we have like a really diverse student group. Um, and just understanding like the difference as foreigners, what our responsibility as, is as travelers. Leadership, um, this comes out especially on X phase, but really throughout the whole semester or summer when we're working in small groups, students are able to find their place as a leader, understanding what they're good at, what they're not good at, what they need to work on, how they can contribute to leadership and like what their specific role in that looks like in a group. Um, and then just eye-opening experiences. These are experiences that you really cannot get without these like local knowledge that the instructors and the program directors have. Um, the people that we work with around the globe, the homestay families, the language instructors, the independent study project apprentices, um, they're really a part of our like Dragon's family and network and we really value and cherish them. Um, and the experiences and connections friendships and just special relationships that we get to experience all over the world are just so transformative for students. Um, and I do just kind of like to add um, a little like shtick about other opportunities that students might receive over the summer, like jobs and internships. Everything is so critical and skill building for students in general is so important. And I think it's nice to do something off the beaten path because you can really experience another place and another culture and learn more about yourself more than you can in other ways. I think some families are nervous that, um, you know, I'm, money aside, I, I know that's obviously like a huge issue of access, um, but that their students should get a job or an internship that looks really good. And I think the skills and just experiences that students can have on programs like these are just insurmountable and, and often really impressive for yourself and just for like employers and colleges in the future. So that's my little, you know, from a competitive public New York school spiel about that. So if you're interested, um, there's still a lot of space on Morocco summer for this year, 2024, and for our semester program. Um, but we do have rolling admissions. So that essentially means that we'll accept applications until the program fills up. Um, so there's no deadline, but I do encourage people to apply early, especially if you're interested in receiving financial aid, um, apply just as soon as you can, just so that we can like really understand who needs aid and so that we can divide that accordingly. Um, the two big things that you need to apply for a Dragons program, the first is our general Dragons application form that can be found on our website. It should not take longer than 20 to 30 minutes. You do not need to stress or like write college length essays. It's really just a chance for us to get to know you. Um, and then we require a deposit that secures your spot on the program. So you're always welcome to deposit before you submit the final Dragons application. And if you are interested in receiving financial aid, we have two forms, they're both needs-based. One is sliding scale tuition that'll give families five to 25% off of a program. Depending on where you fall on that scale, we may ask you to deposit, we may not. And then we have like classic needs-based financial aid, which is given in the form of awards. So we'll essentially ask how much you can contribute to your program and we'll see how much of the rest we can fill. Unfortunately, we do have unlit not unlimited, limited funds for what we can give for financial aid. Um, so again, I just encourage students or families who are interested in receiving financial aid to apply a bit earlier so we can divide it all out across the programs. Um, so those two things are really what it takes to apply. Then we'll do a little interview. Again, it's really a no stress situation. It's just to make sure you're a good fit for dragons. Um, and then you'll get all your program prep materials, packing lists and visas and all the fun juicy stuff um, is what will follow. So I am going to leave it open for questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can see everyone. Um, and if anyone has any questions now is the time. I'm also putting my email in the chat here. So in case you would like to reach out to me with any other specific Morocco related questions, you can shoot me an email as well. Let's 
we'll, we'll also circulate the Zoom recording mm -hmm. and Kristen's info and my info um, so that you guys, if anything comes up, you can always ask. Um, yeah, anyone have anything to ask? Any hesitations? Anything that sounded really exciting? Is anyone looking at Morocco for this summer? Or we're just interested in it generally. Yeah, so the no phone situation. Um, so I explained a bit in the beginning, like why we have the no phones, but just what that looks like on a program. So typically students, we all leave from an airport hub. So correct me if I'm wrong, but Morocco is normally JFK or, okay. Yeah. So we'll meet at JFK. So students, and this kind of goes into travel too, students will be responsible for meeting us at JFK. Typically students bring their phones up until that point. So for instance, when I went on my program, my um, airport hub was LA, So, and I'm from New York. So I brought my phone with me to LA so that I could get on my flight and have music and text my mom that I landed. Um, and then once I landed and my program collected me, we'll collect students from the airport. Um, my flight was actually late at night. So we hung out at a hotel, we swam in the pool, and then we got on our night flight. And then my instructors collected my phone. Um, they hold onto the phone for the duration of the program and they'll give it back once we touch back down in JFK on a Morocco program. Um, you're also welcome to not bring it. Like if you're from New York and you're just getting dropped off at JFK, that's also a good option. It really depends. Throughout the duration of the semester, there's a few ways to um, communicate with your family back home. The main one is the Yak board. This is our student blog. You can find it on our website. And students are able to post reflections and updates and journal entries and just general how they're doing on the Yak board. And their families and friends can all follow along. So that is super awesome. Um, the second way is that while we do prepare students to be out of touch for the duration of the summer or the semester, there is sometimes opportunity when students have that like independent time during home stays to go to a library or a Wi-Fi cafe and call or email home. Um, this, uh, like from personal experience, happened a few times on my program. It typically happens one or two times on a summer program, but we can't guarantee it. Um, so we do just prepare families to be out of touch. If there's an emergency um, or your parents need to get in touch with a student or vice versa, that'll all go through our office. So our risk management office operates 24 seven. Um, you'll call in, you know, say, I need to talk to my son or daughter or child. Um, and then they'll connect you through to our program directors. Um, our instructors have phones and satellite phones with them at all times so that they can always be reached if there's an emergency. Even if we're on a trek in the middle of the Atlas Mountains, they can be reached on that satellite phone. Um, so if someone is sick or needs assistance just for risk management and also for communication purposes at home, we can always be in touch and we kind of use the office as that intermediate point. I'll also add, um, Sammy, sorry, I'll just really yeah. quick mention the YAC board. Um, I just pasted in the chat the yak board um, from uh, last summer in Morocco, the 2023 summer. Um, I think this is a really great way for you to understand and get a glimpse into our programming. These are posts that students have made. And so I encourage you or your, your student to, to have a look at this to see like from the student's perspective or from the perspective of being out in the field, our instructors, there's posts that I, I was um, leading a program last summer as well. And so you might see some posts from me. Um, where I'm discussing like just what's what's going on on the trip. And so, um, yeah, that's a great resource for you all. Do you like give updates on the Yak board? Like, you know, we've arrived and stuff like that for the parents back at home? Yeah. So we'll post like once they touch down in the country. Um, sometimes students are not good at posting on the app board simply because they're having too much fun. Um, I know my group is guilty of that. Our instructors really encourage students to post as much as they can. And the instructors will also post like, you know, a few times a week to update parents. Oh. The only time where there's a stretch that's not sometimes posted is when we're on a trek, but we'll let you know, like, okay, tomorrow we're leaving on a trek. So you may not hear from us until we're back. So you'll be really well vetted. Um, sometimes parents call in and are like, I haven't seen my son post on the act board in a week. And that is always good news. Um, it means that they are right. having a really good time and they're really engaged. Um, but our instructors, they definitely post and give updates on every program. I don't know if Kristen, you want to add to that. 
Yeah, I mean, sometimes students just like sometimes it's hard to get students to post if they don't like writing or things like yeah. that. Um, but, I just would want someone to give me like I would just want to know that things are going okay. I don't actually need yeah. much more than that other than like thumbs up, you know. You'll okay. be you'll be tuned in to that for sure. Yeah, you'll definitely get that on the program. And sometimes, you know, I always encourage students like you don't need to write. Like you can do a photo story. I, I've had students do sketches. Um, you'll see the variety. You can go back into the Yak Board as well, into the archives and read like from previous semesters and programs to see like the different types of posts, but, and you'll see like about how regularly they're, they're up there. So, and yeah, if there's, if there's ever a need or for students to, to reach a home for an emergency or anything, we always give that as an option. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there ever a, so my daughter signed up to go on the trip to Morocco this summer and are there other kids signed up already? Is there ever a chance that there's not enough enrollment or is it, you had said it when you started that there, there was a lot of space left on the trip. Is there ever a chance that the trip doesn't happen or, you know, I'm just trying to get a. Um, there is a chance that trips don't happen, but uh, like I'm confident that Morocco will run this summer. Um, okay. the, sometimes right. we won't fill to 12 students. Like we'll take nine or 10. We, we aim for 10 that yeah. as a minimum. Um, but I would be super, super surprised if it did. Morocco normally always runs one session a year. So I would assume okay. that they're going to run. Um, okay. and when I say it's open, I just mean that we have more than six spaces left or seven spaces. That's kind of when we like start the countdown of like, all right, we need people who are interested to kind of decide soon. Um, but yes, there's other okay. people up on the program for the summer. Okay. Thank you for doing this. It's super informative. Brayden's busy doing, she's busy studying for something right now, but she's going to watch the video afterwards. So I'm grateful that your faces are here and she can see you. So thank you. And if she, again, my email's there. And so if she has more specific okay. questions, tell her that she can feel free to reach out to me. I'm also happy to set up calls with students who are, who are coming on this summer or who are interested in coming on this summer and having a one-on-one -on -one chat with them um, to give them okay. more information or answer any questions that they have. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, if anyone else has a question, we will answer now. And then if not, we are perfectly on time to wrap up. Okay. Um, well, thank you guys all so much for being here. This was so awesome. We will send out the recording and all of the information tomorrow morning. Um, so you'll see that in your inbox soon and have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Bye.